Hi, everyone. Happy holidays and welcome to our final edition of Inside Talc for 2021. My name is Dustin Smith. I work here on the marketing team at Talc, and thank you for taking the time to join us today from wherever you happen to be logging in from. This uh, event series, Inside Talc, is our, is our monthly uh, events designed to educate, inform, inspire um, future travel. And we tap into our wonderful partners our tour architects, our Tauk tour directors from around the world to give you just a small taste of what you can expect on tour with Tauk. Today, we have a really special presentation to end the year with our great partner out in Rome, Olga. Um, and she will be introduced by Brenda McKellar, who I will tell you about in just a second. But just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, just so you know, you were joining us today on Zoom webinar, you are all on mute. If you do have questions, please type them into the chat function. I will be looking at that throughout. I will answer what I can throughout the presentation, but Olga and Brenda are really the experts on Rome and Italy. So I will wait till the end and I will ask those questions and we'll try to get to as many as we can uh, as possible. I know many of you probably have questions about your upcoming travel. And first of all, we thank you for your booking. Um, we won't be getting into any specifics about traveling today. Uh, if you do have uh, or want to ask those questions, I urge you to, to contact our reservation sales counselors and they will be able to answer those for you. The presentation today will last roughly one hour. Uh, it is being recorded and will be available for later viewing if you need to jump off early. We're also streaming live on Facebook. So if you want to invite a friend last minute or if you have any technical difficulties with Zoom and you want to jump on Facebook, you can find us on uh, Tauk's Facebook page. And lastly, we'll, we will be sharing a bunch of images and, and some short video clips throughout. You do have the option to toggle a black or gray bar, vertical bar on your screen, left or right, to either make myself, the speaker bigger, Olga, or the um, pictures bigger. So you do that at your own leisure. Um, okay, I think that's it. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Brenda McKellar. She is our tour architect for all things Italy. She plans all of our Italian journeys, including our bridges family trips, um, and she will have the pleasure of introducing Olga today. So Brenda, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dustin, and good evening, good afternoon, or good morning to everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. You are in for such a treat this evening because Olga is one of my favorite partners, and we go back to 2010 when we worked on a Roman holiday event together, our Tauk's 85th anniversary event. And we've become friends ever since. And uh, Olga currently manages all of our Tauk Bridges tours, of which we have one coming up next week, a holiday Bridges departure, which we're delighted uh, to, to have this season ending out the year. Uh, Olga is a licensed tour guide of Rome and the Vatican City, but she also has a master's degree in arts management from the American University of Rome. Uh, she is probably the most knowledgeable guide I know, and she's planned a special um, uh, show for you this evening uh, with her own photographs. So I'm sure you're really going to enjoy. She also has a wonderful website that uh, she will talk to at, at the end of the program, but um, she offers some wonderful uh, webinars on her website if you ever want to learn a little bit more about Rome. And we've got seven or eight itineraries with Tauk that come through this magnificent city. And without further ado, I would like to present Olga and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Enjoy, everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brenda, so much. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here and uh, present my beloved Rome, the capital of the world, they say. It's an old way of calling Rome Caput Mundi. It does go back to the ancient times when it was the capital of the empire, of the ancient Roman Empire, but kind of stuck and uh, and remained and uh, eternal city caput mundi rome has uh, so many names and uh, this photograph was taken at the piazza venezia the main square with this monument uh, that's uh, let's say generally known as the wedding cake but we shouldn't call it like that here officially because it does have a name vittoriano dedicated to the first king of united italy victor emmanuel and uh, this is now Piazza Venezia from a different angle and this impressive monument that's well only about 100 years old you know in Rome it's like yesterday but it has fascinating fascinating history but before getting to to Rome uh, I would just 
like to remind you as if you didn't know that there are so many amazing places to visit in Italy, it never ends. You could spend uh, three lifetimes uh, going between uh, Venice and uh, Cinque Terre and Florence, uh, Umbria, Perugia, uh, Rome, um, Sorrento, Amalfi, the Bay of Naples, uh, Sicily, Sardinia, Puglia, you just name it. But I'll just mention really briefly uh, a few places that are included in the tours uh, that take you to Rome as well. I took this photograph in 2017 and those hands coming out from the Grand Canal are no longer there. They're part of the exhibition with the Biennale and uh, they were done by Lorenzo Quinn, the son of the more famous, maybe for my generation and older, uh, famous father, Anthony Quinn. And uh, Florence, uh, the cradle of the Renaissance uh, in the middle of the rolling hills of Tuscany, one of the most famous regions in the world. You may go to the so-called quieter sister of Tuscany, which is uh, Umbria. This is a lovely cathedral in uh, Orvieto, a charming small town perched uh, on a volcanic cliff, really, really impressive. Or you may decide to go down south and uh, enjoy even some Norman, Arab Norman architecture. This is the cathedral of uh, the small town of uh, Amalfi, which gave name to the coast, Amalfi coast, south of Naples. And uh, this is a Positano, one of the most beautiful places on this planet, perched on the, on the cliff. And nearby, uh, a bigger city, let's say Sorrento, uh, facing uh, the amazing bay of Naples. Naples is an extraordinary uh, city with so many uh, sides to it, but uh, uh, you just forget about hassle-free vacation, let's say but uh, it's one of the most charming places on this earth with this um, ill-mannered volcano, Vesuvius, looming uh, beyond uh, uh, the bay. And uh, of course, talking about Vesuvius, you would like to go to Pompeii, the city that was uh, covered with the um, eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD. And as uh, Wolfgang von Goethe said, never a disaster was a source of uh, so much delight for future generations. That is basically the only place where you can see ancient Roman roads uh, preserved so well because they were encapsulated in the eruption. And uh, talking about the roads, well, we know that all roads lead to Rome. And now we have uh, jumped into the ancient Roman forum. This is one of the roads that you can see there. But before I start talking about Rome and the different sites. I will be mentioning some of the sites that we do visit uh, on our tours uh, with, uh, with Tauk and also um, some others that you may would like to visit either during your free time if you're on a tour or if you come independently. If you decide to come a little bit earlier or stay, stay later, you really would have an embarrassment of, uh, of choice. But um, I would like to show you, just to give you a um, very general idea about where we will be going, the, the center, the historical center of Rome is right in the center of this map. And um, I will try to use my, my cursor and hope you can all see it. You see here, there is the famous uh, Pantheon, which we are going to take a look. I can take a look at, then uh, we're going to see the Piazza Navona, arguably the most beautiful square in Rome. And going more to the right on the map, there is a Trevi, Trevi Fountain. And more north, uh, Piazza di Spagna, the famous uh, Spanish steps. And all the way up at the top, there's this huge garden, beautiful Villa Borghese, where there is the Gallery Borghese, also one of the most exciting and beautiful museums uh, that we have in, uh, in Rome. There is no shortage. And uh, all the way to the right is the railway station, just to give you an idea about what these big lines uh, are. But south of the, of the railway station, now I'm here at, uh, um, let's say, southeast, where there is the M, red M for San Giovanni, that is the name of the Cathedral of Rome, or St. John in, uh, in Lateran, here at the bottom to the right and um, even farther south, uh, there is a um, site called the Baths of Caracalla. I'm going to show you that as well. Uh, just um, one slide, the ancient ruins where we used to go with some tall groups and I hope we'll go again. And then Circus Maximus, uh, the stadium where they used to have uh, chariot races. Now it's a big empty space. That is a monument in itself. And then farther, a little bit more north, you see where there's another red sign. There is a Colosseum. These M's are the, the metro stops. 
But okay, here's the Colosseum. And then you go more to the left or towards west, the uh, Roman Forum, the ruins of ancient Roman Forum. And um, if you cross to the river, which um, we call in English Tiber, but in Italian it's Tevere. So there is this um, shabby chic, uh, but expensive. You know, when you see something shabby, it's chic. Well, it's expensive, but it's a really, really charming neighborhood called Tras Tevere across the Tiber. In the middle is the little island, Isola Tiberina. If you cross the island, you would find yourselves uh, in the Jewish ghetto, which is another one of those uh, shabby chic neighborhoods full of history, of uh, pleasant and unpleasant, obviously, and also great uh, food. You're going to pay a short visit to the Jewish ghetto as well. And then crossing the river more northwest, here is the Vatican City. Well, that's where there is the Basilica of St. Peter's, the Sistine Chapel, and the Vatican Museums. So we're going to talk more or less about these places that uh, I have briefly mentioned. And uh, you will have the, the map in the event recorded, so you can go back to the map and um, see where these sites are located. It's not easy to remember, by the way, if you haven't been to Rome. And back to the ancient Roman Forum. What does forum mean? Uh, there are several theories about the origin of the, of the word, but they're all equally boring. What it came to mean is a place where people gathered for social, political, religious purposes. It's a sort of a social media of the, of the past. And it's a valley that was drained in the sixth century BC uh, with a huge canal called the Cloaca Maxima, like a huge sewer basically. And uh, it's full of ancient temples, uh, basilicas, uh, which back then meant the, like, the courthouses. And uh, it's visitable obviously. And uh, it is one of the most exciting places to, to see in, uh, in Rome. This is the Capitol Hill where there was the center of the political life. For example, uh, this building that you're looking at with the bell tower is today the town hall, but in the middle ages, it was the Senate. And at the bottom where you see those arches, that was the archives, the archive already in the first century BC. So it really goes back uh, a long way. And it's just a sort of a double faced hill so if you approached it from the opposite side, which is the actual uh, entrance to, to the hill, that's what you would see. The, the architecture we owe to um, one and only Michelangelo. Now, back to the ancient Roman Forum. This is the view from the Capitol Hill. And uh, we see, the, again, the temples, the triumphal arches. There are only three triumphal arches that remain in Rome out of approximately 30 that uh, used to be there in the ancient times. And far away, the far end, you can see the, the Colosseum, which we will get back to. Of course, the churches uh, as well that were built on top of ancient Roman monuments frequently within the temples. We're going to see that again. And um, inside the forum, you may stumble upon or go on purpose to, to a place where Julius Caesar was cremated. Uh, there was a temple dedicated to him uh, by his adopted son, uh, Augustus, and uh, he was the first man to be deified. And for some reason, there are still people who, well, bring flowers to Julius Caesar. Well, why is that? I really don't know, but the little coins, uh, there have been there in all the places where people were trying for some luck. Uh, so um, little coins, you can find them everywhere. People just uh, saying a little, little prayer, saying a little wish. I don't know what Julius Caesar has to do with that, but there they are. And uh, another gorgeous view from the Capitol Hill is um, at the Imperial Fora, which is the plural of the Forum. See the extension of uh, the temples and the basilicas, uh, the forums uh, of Fora, I should say, of different emperors, uh, divided by that gray wall, which is igneous, uh, so built of a volcanic rock. It used to divide uh, the then, back then, poor neighborhood called Suburra from the uh, official center of the capital of the empire. You see a big, big empty space and a large road, but that's modern. That's the result of uh, Mussolini's um, destruction, actually, of the many layers of, uh, of history to create this road for his uh, military parades in the late 19, 1930s. It's like the Erthery for traffic between the ancient Roman Forum and uh, the Imperial Fora. 
Now, talking about the ruins, uh, well, there's the embarrassment of choice. Uh, these are the baths of uh, Caracalla. Caracalla was the emperor in the third century and the thermal baths were built uh, for um, all the people of Rome. There were 11 huge public baths. Of course, wealthy people had uh, their own. They were called Valnea, but uh, the public baths were just thermal baths of Caracalla. Today, they are the stage for operas and shows and ballets. Uh, it's an amazing sight. And uh, more ruins, but in the very heart of Rome, uh, there is this square where four temples were discovered from the Republican times, so before the empire. And uh, that goes back to the, the discovery, goes back to the 1920s. And this is where Julius Caesar was actually assassinated because the building of the Senate was uh, under the construction during the times of his rule as a part of the triumvirate. And uh, this is now a square called Torre Argentina. Now, Pantheon. We must always mention the Pantheon, one, one of the most exciting and uh, unique buildings in, in the world. Uh, it was a former temple, most likely dedicated to all the gods, which the name says like Pan, Theon, Pan, all Theo, God, all right, so Pan, Theon, but there are also other, other theories, but I would like to show it to you also inside, because from the outside, it looks just like a gigantic cylinder with a relatively shallow dome on top. But uh, when you go inside, and we do, you know, during our tours, we go inside uh, and uh, this is really overwhelming, this huge dome uh, that is made of one monolith piece of concrete. And yes, that's the hole. And uh, when it rains, well, it rains because it's a hole. But uh, uh, there are all these stories about how mysterious the Pantheon is. And when it rains, it doesn't rain, it does. But the Romans, made them the drains so uh, the water is uh, safely taken to the to the sewer there's so much to say about the pantheon we could spend this whole presentation just talking about it but um, i would like to show i wanted to show you just briefly what it's all what it's about not what it's all about that would require much more time and uh, that's not the only building that became a church pantheon is a church today a basilica ever since um, it was proclaimed such in the seventh century but there are more churches that were built uh, within the ancient roman temples this is uh, saint nicholas built within an ancient roman temple or there's a lot of uh, uh, building material that was used uh, recycled from ancient rome for the churches so or the palaces uh, of either popes or whoever was in uh, in power noble families and uh, this is one of the four papal basilicas, St. Mary Major, and uh, it has the 40 columns uh, from a nearby temple from the Esquilin Hill, where it's located. And this is one of the most uh, beautiful churches in, in Rome. And again, it's one of the four major basilicas, and only four basilicas have that title, the papal ones. And uh, it was, um, for example, the ceiling was gilded with the first gold that, that came from, uh, from Americas. And uh, it contains one of the most important relics of the Christianity, the, the Holy Crib of Jesus Christ. And uh, here is, uh, according to the tradition, you know, there's so much uh, in Rome uh, to talk about the relics and, and the pilgrimages. And here is the Pope Pius IX, a recent Pope actually for the history in the 1800s. And uh, uh, he's represented in this humble praying position as if he were uh, a pilgrim. And if you were a pilgrim, you would definitely want to go to the Cathedral of Rome, St. John in uh, Lateran. What you see on this slide is um, the first on the left is the cathedral, which is uh, the title of a church where there is the Cathedra of the Bishop. The Bishop of Rome is uh, Pope. So uh, Pope is uh, one busy, busy man. And he's the head of a state as well, of course. And the orange building are the offices of the, of the Vatican, the so-called uh, Lateran Palace. And the structure to the right is the so-called Scala Santa, the Holy Stairs. We're going to get there as well. The cathedral is marked by an ancient Egyptian obelisk. So you're looking at the cathedral, you don't see it. But if you approach it from St. Mary Major, if you're on the pilgrim's route, you will see this biggest, oldest obelisk that we have in Rome brought from Egypt. It goes back to the 15th century BC. 
and it used to be in the Circus Maximus, where they had the, the chariot races. And it was the part of the urban organization of the Pope Sixtus V, who had a brilliant idea to use some of these obelisks as a sort of a, I call them GPS for the pilgrims. So which way do I go? Well, there's a pagan monument, but it's not pagan anymore because it has a cross at the top. It was Christianized. And uh, inside the cathedral is, uh, I'm gonna say it, it is Baroque, but it's actually, it was actually baroque up because there were many other styles that you can see, like, the, for example, the Gothic, which is very rare in, uh, in Rome. There's also an extraordinary cloister. It's a, it's a lovely, lovely church, and not to mention the mother of all the churches. And across the street, uh, there is that small building with the so-called Scala Santa, the holy stairs, that, according to the tradition, are the stairs that uh, Saint Helen, mother of Emperor Constantine, brought from, from Jerusalem, and the pilgrims are climbing them on their knees. We used to go there as a part of our program for the Roman holiday event that um, Brenda mentioned at the, at the beginning, but of course we didn't go on our knees. But uh, there are the stairs uh, on the side that uh, take you, if you wish to go, to a small chapel that used to be the private chapel of the popes before the Sistine Chapel. There are these extraordinary 13th century uh, mosaics and, uh, and so much more to, to talk about. One of the holiest places uh, in Rome, especially, of course, for the, for the pilgrims. And I will mention just uh, one more of the papal basilicas, uh, St. Paul outside the walls. So this is where the tomb of Paul is, the apostle. And uh, it never disappoints. Uh, sometimes when we have logistical issues, for example, there is um, all of a sudden there is some kind of event at St. Peter's and we cannot go. Uh, we offer St. Paul as um, an alternative and uh, no one ever left uh, unsatisfied because uh, it's not just about the school structure that mainly goes back to about 100, 150 years ago because a huge part of the basilica was destroyed in a big fire, but there also sections which remain from the past uh, and uh, the tomb of St. Paul in itself uh, and the portraits of all the popes starting from, from Peter to this day, there's plenty, plenty to see at St. Paul outside the, the walls. And in order to go to St. Peter's or the Vatican, we have to cross the river. We have to cross uh, uh, this, either this bridge or many of other bridges, but I chose to show this one because it is so historical and uh, it's called Ponte Sisto because the Pope who built it, his name was Sixtus IV, and uh, it's the same Pope who built the Sistine Chapel. And you see the hole in the middle of the, of the bridge and uh, it's, it's not there just for the decoration, although it looks uh, lovely, but uh, in case of a very heavy rain in a sense of a long period of heavy rain, this river used to flood tremendously and uh, the hole releases the pressure of the, of the water and prevents the bridge from, uh, from breaking. And uh, again, it's a, it's a pedestrian bridge today. And uh, far away, you can see the, the dome of the St. Peter's Basilica. So here we are at the St. Peter's Square. I would like to show it to you a little better with another obelisk that was brought from Egypt, but was made by ancient Romans. That the last building that we just um, are looking at, that's the building that's known as the Apostolic Palace. And uh, that is where the popes uh, usually live. At the top floor, there is the papal apartment. The current Pope Francesco, he chose to live in the residential area. So, but he does respect, of course, the, uh, the tradition of showing up at the balcony, uh, the, sorry, at the, at the window of, that's, let me show you, the second window, top floor, second window from the right is uh, the study of the papal apartments and the Pope shows up there every Sunday, 12 o'clock to, to bless everyone. And uh, we visit the St. Peter's Basilica doing our tours uh, and also this tiny little building to the right, you see this little roof with the, the lightning rod well, that's the Sistine Chapel, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. But um, here is St. Peter's Basilica below the dome, which was uh, originally designed by uh, Michelangelo, then completed actually 20 years after his death. And it's right above 
this baldacchino, the main altar that was designed by the genius of Baroque, the inventor of Baroque, uh, Gian Lorenzo Bernini. So baldacchinos uh, are made of uh, fabric normally, but of course here he made it of bronze, but as if it were a curtain. So with uh, the curtains and um, the pom-poms. So uh, he mixed uh, the genres, the style and the painting and sculpting and uh, architecture. So thanks to Bernini, we have uh, so much in, in Rome. We do the tours, just covering just uh, Bernini's architecture and, uh, and art. And now the Sistine Chapel, but to get to the Sistine Chapel, we cannot simply just climb uh, from the St. Peter's Basilica, but we have to go to the Vatican Museums. And uh, that is the visit that is always included. And we have this special treat uh, to be there just by ourselves, just the uh, talk groups. Uh, and um, we go also to visit briefly the um, chambers or uh, Raphael's rooms. Those were the apartments of Julius II, painted by Raphael and uh, his pupils, most importantly. We get to see this fresco that's known as the School of Athens where Raphael represented the triumph of, of truth. He actually painted a concept by representing these smart people uh, from the past all the way to his time. Some are the portraits of the contemporaries. For example, in the, in the very center, you see these two gentlemen in the middle of the arch. That's the, those are Plato and Aristotle. Where Plato to the left is the portrait of Leonardo da Vinci, who was a contemporary. But uh, most importantly, there is Heraclitus, but this is actually homage to Michelangelo. Raphael was about 10 years younger. They were working at the same time, Raphael in the Pope's apartment, Michelangelo in the Pope's private chapel, painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And Raphael represented Michelangelo after having seen the ceiling and uh, falling in love with his muscular frames, he became what we call a Michelangelesque, and uh, he represented Michelangelo the way he would have represented uh, himself. You see that huge knee, those bones, those shoulders. And uh, the inspiration came from some ancient Roman statues, uh, which some are in the possession of the Vatican Museums. This is the famous torso, which inspired not only Michelangelo, but also artists like uh, Picasso, Rodin, the thinker, and less known fact is that it inspired Jackson Pollock as well. There was an amazing exhibition in Florence some years ago with the drawings Jackson Pollock made of the torso and of the creation of, uh, of Adam. This is what we get to see in the Sistine Chapel. See both Adam and God have this incredible six pack inspired by the by the torso and the god is represented as a, as a man in his prime with the, the face and the head of a mature man so he's transmitting both wisdom and uh, and strength and the handsome uh adam he's uh, he's not standing because he can't it's, it's only one part of his body actually has come to life in front of our eyes and uh, the remaining part just look at his right right hand is still not uh, not alive but it's just one uh, it will be in a minute but uh, uh, it's just one of the amazing nine panels in the center of the ceiling uh, with the creation of the world but Michelangelo did not only paint that uh, he came back when he was in his 60s and he painted uh, the last judgment so uh, we entered the Sistine Chapel through that little door that's on our right here and we find the last judgment immediately to our right it took him five years and uh, this is an old photo of one of our tours if you see any people they are not my group it's another talk group so it's really just for us if you have been to the vatican museums uh, during the day then you, when we say that the, the crowds at the vatican museums you know what what we are talking about so this is a very special treat and we leave the museums down this uh, uh, double spiral ramp that goes back to the 1930s, but also in, was inspiration to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright for um, Guggenheim Museum in, uh, in New York. So it's all very impressive, but if you just would like to decompress and uh, spend some time walking around the charming streets of Rome, here is uh, Trastevere, 
again, across the Tiber, remember that, uh, uh, that became one of those shabby, chic, expensive neighborhoods. Or, of course, the, the ghetto. The ghetto is on everybody's list uh, for history, for uh, cultural uh, tours. Of course, there is um, a Jewish museum. This is a synagogue, the synagogue, the great synagogue of Rome, built in 1904, because the actual ghetto does not really exist anymore. It was replaced by this new neighborhood because during the urbanization of Rome in the late 1800s, some of the neighborhoods, many of the neighborhoods that were in a <clears throat> bad shape were replaced <clears throat> sorry, by um, new modern, uh, modern structures. So here is the, the synagogue, but around what used to be the ghetto, there are older buildings, for example, the part of the so-called Portico d'Ottavia that goes back to the times of um, Emperor Augustus. And apart from the, the history and, uh, and culture, we do go to the ghetto a lot for great food, absolutely great food. There are so many excellent uh, restaurants and uh, most famously, everybody wants to taste uh, <coughs> a Jewish artichoke. It's not really Jewish artichoke, but Jewish style, uh, double fried uh, crispy artichokes. But uh, you have to start your day with something. And in Italy, you will start with one of these marvels that anywhere else on this planet would be desserts. But uh, in Italy, they're mainly uh, breakfast a deal. And uh, you see me with my, my friends, you know, there's a cappuccino. We're always joking, you know, after 10 o'clock, there's a cappuccino police, uh, maybe until 11, if they are more, more indulgent cappuccino police so it's a breakfast thing but it is just obviously a joke uh, because you can have whatever you like whenever you want but uh, uh, let's say that Italians would normally have a cappuccino for breakfast uh, and espresso and these amazing uh, uh, sweets are for example you could choose here at the top to the left uh, there are the cannoli or cannolo is one cannoli is plural that's Sicilian, typically Sicilian with ricotta. And uh, here to the right is, that's what I love, the maritozzo, typically Roman, a little sweet bun with whipped cream. And then uh, in the front row, there are the sfogliatellas, so sfogliatella from uh, Naples area. So great way to start your day. And uh, then come lunch, you may would like to have something um, light. Uh, I'll just mention a few things that are uh, very typically Roman. For example, this is also southern Italy a lot because bufala, mozzarella di bufala comes from, from southern Italy and uh, of course uh, lovely cherry tomatoes and uh, well, basil for the patriotic combination of colors like a pizza margherita as well, the same combination of colors and ingredients. And uh, if you're in Rome, <clears throat> and that's where we are, so I would recommend uh, carbonara with the big cheek and uh, a great combination of like eggs and, uh, and uh, pecorino cheese. And uh, you may would like to have um, uh, cacio and pepe, which is also a typically uh, a Roman recipe, not common anywhere else, which is use milk. So pecorino and uh, uh, just pepper, no cream, no, no. Or you would like to just have a slice of pizza and some prosciutto to keep it simple. For Italians, pizza is an evening meal, but um, of course you can have it uh, anytime you, you please. And uh, at the end of all that, you may would like to lift yourself up, lift me up, tira mi su. That is this great uh, dessert that contains a bit of coffee. So that's why it lifts you, lifts you up. Or of course, gelato, you know, you can't leave. Italy without uh, having tasted the several places. Always ask the, the locals because there's so much gelato everywhere. I just obviously adore it. You can also splurge on gelato. You know, there are these, this one I remember, it was absolutely worth every, I don't even want to remember how much, but uh, uh, it was extraordinary. So there is gelatos and gelatos, but there are plenty. And again, just uh, ask the locals uh, and we'll direct you or take you. And now that our time is full, then we can go back to, uh, well, homework. We can go back to take a look at uh, Ludus Magnum. You know, at first it may not sound familiar, but this is where the gladiators were trained 
for their fights uh, at the Colosseum. Colosseum, uh, one of the 200 amphitheaters that were found at the territory of the former Roman Empire. Plenty of theaters, but um, about 200 amphitheaters or double theaters. And uh, inside, we can take uh, a look at uh, what has remained of the, of the structure, actually. Uh, the tunnels that were under the stage were not visible to the audience back then. They're visible to us uh, to us now. You can see them here and just the part of the stage that was uh, restored. So it took eight years to build the Colosseum, goes back to the first century, could take about 50,000 people. And of course, everybody likes to hear the stories about the gladiators and uh, what was happening in this amphitheater. A lot. That's a tour. A tour in itself. Now, really close by, there is this um, huge empty valley that is known as the former Circus Maximus or huge stadium. That is where, again, they had chariot races uh, and uh, it was much deeper back in the past, about 15 feet or five meters. It silted in the Middle Ages. It was used as a farmland. And then the farms were removed in the late 1800s. And this is now like a national monument, empty, empty as it is, used for big public events. There's a great view of the Palatine Hill, better in the afternoon when the sun is behind you, if you would like to take some nice pictures of the, of the ruins of the Palatine Hill, where everything started. In 753, Rome was founded on this hill and eventually the emperors uh, lived there and it gave us the word uh, palace or palazzo. <clears throat> so the Palatine is one of the seven hills uh, of Rome, seven hills, the original seven hills of ancient Rome. There are about 30 humps and bumps, as a British friend of mine would say, but uh, uh, seven are those historical hills. And we also do have some pyramids, you know, there is really the embarrassment of choice when it comes to uh, what you would like to do, where you would like to go in, in Rome. Of course, as I mentioned, uh, I did list a few things that we do visit with our tours, uh, but there are so many that you can visit if you decide to extend your stay or, or come back. And uh, this does look like a pyramid, but it's actually a tomb of an ancient Roman from 2000 years ago, built in the shape of, of a pyramid. This is um, one of the gates that make part of the third century wall, third century AD wall that's uh, 13 miles long that was built to prevent the so-called barbarians from entering Rome. Uh, so, see, I'm trying to squeeze in about 3,000 years of history in about, well, 45 minutes, more or less. And um, something that I would warmly recommend for those who have more time uh, is to visit the Gallery Borghese. On, on my site, you can find the presentation in detail about those amazing works of art collected by a cardinal who was the nephew of the Pope, Paul V, Cardinal Borghese. You go there to admire so much, but let's say most famously uh, Bernini's uh, statues. This is Bernini's uh, uh, David, King David, and also Bernini's uh, Rape of Proserpine, uh, the famous marble statue full of um, emotions where Hades grabs Proserpine and takes her down to the underworld uh, and eventually she well becomes the, the queen of the underworld, the goddess of the, of the underworld. And there are many more Baroque palaces if you are more into um, Baroque and how did the papal families live. There is this extraordinary museum, uh, Doria Pamfiglia. The family is uh, still around and uh, this museum is really worth visiting. And there is um, Palazzo Colonna uh, where we used to go on uh, some of our events and I hope we will go again. And uh, it has peculiar opening hours just uh, let's say Saturday morning, but it's possible to organize private tours. But let's say if you are in Rome on Saturday morning, you may would like to see this hall where in the movie, Roman Holiday, uh, Gregory Peck and uh, Audrey Hepburn look at each other and I'm not going to tell you if they elope or not. You have to, I'm sure most of you know. But uh, this is the hall where she finds out that um, <clears throat> he's a journalist. And again, it was part of our tour Roman holiday and it's still part of some other tours, not, not the bridges. 
uh, that I handle with my team of, uh, we like to say we're kid-friendly uh, colleagues and, and friends. Uh, those are tours adapted to, to children. And uh, also, of course, adults. We're friendly with adults too. And uh, so that's just a little close up of that extraordinary hall at the Palazzo Colonna. Or you may would like to just go for a leisurely stroll. And uh, although this castle called uh, Castel Sant'Angelo, not far, not far away from the, from the Vatican, uh, just about 10 minutes walk, it is a museum, but uh, uh, you can just uh, wander around the, the neighborhood and maybe cross the bridge, which is uh, also pedestrian and uh, pick up your favorite Bernini's angel. He designed these angels, um, they're flanking the, the fence of the, of the bridge. Uh, each one carries a different uh, so-called instrument of the Christ, the passion. This one is carrying the, the column of the, of the flagellation. And of course, Piazza Navona, it's included in uh, most of the tours. Uh, Piazza Navona is arguably the most beautiful square in, uh, in Rome. It was um, formerly, 2000 years ago, it was an um, ancient Roman stadium. And that's why it retains this peculiar shape because the buildings that came in later centuries were built on top of the pre-existing structures. And in the, in the very center, right in front of the Church of St. Agnes, uh, there is the famous fountain by Bernini, again, the four river gods uh, that represent four continents uh, known at that time, surmounted by what looks like an ancient Egyptian obelisk, but it's slightly deceitful. It's actually um, 2000 years old ancient Roman knockoff. So that's one of our little stories that we, that we tell and also about how it was found out and uh, all that, that it's not Egyptian. And uh, you may would like to follow the Caravaggio's trail. Uh, we try to include the Caravaggio wherever possible, especially the one in the St. Louis of France, if there is, if there is time. And uh, he's this uh, irrespectful artist. Uh, there is several of his works at the Gallery Borghese as well, but also in, the three, in three churches in, in Rome. This is one of them with the cycle of his paintings uh, dedicated to Saint Matthew, the choosing of Matthew. He was Jesus Christ coming as a light from that wall and, uh, and choosing Matthew, the painter who at the end of the 1500s, beginning of the 1600s, uh, changed the, the history of art with his uh, realistic presentations of even Saint Mary and, uh, and Jesus, famous for his dirty feet, yeah. just like. And um, you may be in mood of something completely different, which would be, for example, to the left, you can see some rationalist or fascist architecture surrounding uh, the mausoleum of Emperor Augustus. Now, this is an incredible contrast. And uh, just recently, this mausoleum opened after years and years of uh, restorations, and uh, it's really fascinating. So. You come to Rome, you just get to, okay, I'd like archae uh, archaeology, architecture, food, uh, just wandering around, uh, Catholic churches, uh, uh, the Jewish history, anything, anything. Really, it's a bottomless uh, treasure box. And uh, we frequently try to just stick, we see how old the kids are in the group. And uh, then we ask them, did you bring any food for elephants? Uh, in any case, well, maybe. There's this little Bernini's uh, uh, elephant uh, right behind the, the Pantheon. So there's also lizards and lions and uh, plenty, plenty of fun animals uh, to go on a safari in Rome as well. That's something that can be done. Or we teach everyone how to drink water from these fun fountains that look like big noses. And that's how we call them, il nasone, like a big nose. And what do you do with it? How do you drink water from that? Well, there's a hole, you press at the bottom, oops, the jet comes out. So everybody learns that in, uh, in Rome. Or if we want to make sure nobody's saying any lie, well, it's difficult, of course, to include, for example, also uh, the, the mouth of truth, but uh, if you stay longer and if that's something you want to do, uh, it's, uh, it's there. And uh, it's also in the movie Roman Holiday. And you know how it goes. If you say a lie, that mouth might bite off your fingers. So it's even popular in um, Asia. 
it found its way in one of the famous manga uh, comic books. So the mouth of truth is um, everywhere internationally. And back to extraordinary uh, fascist architecture, this is the stadium where if, when people ask for specific tours, then some would like to see some of that kind of architecture. And I find the stadium really extraordinary. Even that huge big building behind in the backdrop, it's also uh, 1930s Mussolini's period. And uh, that is the um, Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs. Or there is a whole neighborhood that was built in the, in the 19, um, let's say late 1930s, early 1940s, preparing for the big world exhibition that, well, never took place because of the Second World War. Uh, this is the mm, popular Square Coliseum from, from that time, lovely at night as well. And currently it's rented by Fendi. It's a uh, headquarters of the, of the fashion brand uh, Fendi. They just had an um, extraordinary exhibition of one of their famous purses, Baguette, uh, but each region of Italy uh, there were 20 made a specific kind of a purse using their uh, arts and crafts. So it was really, really, really nice. So it's still, it's still on for another month, I believe. And uh, modern architecture, there's Zaha Hadid uh, uh, designed the, the, the Maxi uh, Museum with uh, her famous uh, flowing architecture. Or also recently, the architect whose name uh, is Fuxas uh, designed this Congress Center that's not normally open to visits, but if there are events, just uh, recently there was an event dedicated to contemporary art for the first time. Rome has a really great uh, uh, fair with um, contemporary art. Uh, normally you would go to Turin or Milan for that. And uh, inside this glass building, there's this cloud, La Nuvola, and you see how small people are looking at the um, escalator stairs and the whole Congress Center is inside this cloud. And uh, you may like it or not, but it really is, uh, is uh, striking. I find it striking. And um, if you really would like to see all that and even more, what you have to do is come back to Rome, not just once or stay longer, but in case you wanted to come back, well, you have to go to the Trevi Fountain and uh, you have to, well, throw that coin down the drain with your right hand over your left shoulder and definitely you will come back to Rome. Uh, I'm personally from Croatia and uh, I came to Rome in 1985 as a, as a tourist and I'm always joking, I must have dropped the whole wallet into that fountain because in 92, um, I uh, moved to Rome. So very soon it's going to be, well, 30, 30 years and um, I'm so um, happy I made it uh, my city, the city that I really, really love. And um, if you enjoyed this presentation, I hope you did. You will come on talk tours or you will just come to Rome and enjoy it. On my site, you can find uh, several presentations uh, on different aspects and pilgrimages and architecture and uh, a, lot of, a lot of things. I'm preparing also something on food and there's going to be more Gallery Borghese and all that. And um, if you're invited, it's for free, it's, it's there. And if you have any questions that you may have forgotten to, to ask during this event or um, something pops into your mind, there's my my email and I'll be I'll be happy to to answer any any time. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Olga. You know, I lived in Rome, as you know, for five years, and it's still not enough time. You made me want to go back again and again to the Eternal City. So we so appreciate your taking the time to create this very creative presentation for us. And uh, we hope that uh, all of you out there yearn to come to Rome again, or for the first time, if you've never been. I think Dustin is going to open it up to questions. And I do see there are a few uh, on the chat. So I'm going to turn it over to Dustin. And again, thank you so much, Olga. So thank you, Brenda. It. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thank Stauk, for being in my life. <laughs> That's very nice. Thank you, Brenda and Olga. That was a wealth of information in 45 minutes time going all through Rome. <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining us. 
we do have some questions coming in. I want to start though. I always like to ask, you know, Rome so well, you're always, you're in depth with everything on a Sunday afternoon. What are you doing yourself in Rome, Olga, in your city? Where are you going to enjoy your day? On Sunday afternoon. Well, if you're not um, working, of course. If I'm not working, obviously. Um, well, on Sunday afternoon, I'm actually resting from shopping. And uh, I know it sounds like, is this woman going to a TJ Maxx? No, since we do not have <laughs> TJ Maxx, which is horrible. Uh, we have um, uh, also, it's very near where, where I live. It's called Porta Portese. It's a flea market. It's enormous. And uh, usually on Sunday, my, my friends come over, everybody loves it. And uh, I know little stands, uh, so what do you want? You know, people who haven't been frequently. So we just love to stroll through the, through the market. And of course we know the streets, which are kind of, oh, that's, not, that's not interesting. Or oh, here, you know, here is this Max Mara stand on for 20 euro. And uh, so we just enjoy frequently. My friends come over on, uh, on Sunday and uh, we just stroll through the markets and, and we, well, watch movies. <laughs> but let's say in, in Rome, uh, if you would like to do more sightseeing, I'm really lucky to make a part of this great community of, of tour guides. And uh, since the lockdown started, actually, as soon as we could go out on the, on the streets, uh, we started organizing tours. And I'm following my colleagues like this afternoon. I followed an uh, archaeologist, one of the colleagues who took us to um, one of the national museums, uh, archaeological museums, the Baths of Diocletian. Yesterday, I went to Vittoriano, the big white monument with another colleague who specialized in Italian unification. So frequently, at least once a week, I follow and there's more, more events. So I must say that there's plenty, plenty to learn uh, even after 30 years. Not that you haven't been there, but there's always something new right. to hear. Right, right. Thank you, thank you, Olga. Um, a question way earlier when you were showing some of the mosaics, um, one guest commented that some of them looked uh, Byzantine and they wanted to know if, what the connection was there. The connection uh, is um, cultural historical. In the, in the eighth century, there was the so-called the period of the iconoclasm in the Eastern Roman Empire, in the Byzantine Empire, when the representing of the images uh, was uh, banned. Uh, because it reflects uh, what the Old Testament says. So there was the emperor in the Eastern Roman Empire who said no more images in the churches, no more icons. And the artists actually flocked to, to Europe. They brought their art with them. So it influenced the medieval art all over Europe. And uh, so it's Byzantine influenced. That, that kind of art is uh, sort of bi-dimensional. There doesn't have like 3D like Renaissance, because those are actually the images that take us into another world. So they do not have to be uh, represented in 3D. But yes, it is, it is Byzantine uh, influence all the way until Giotto, uh, let's say, and the Renaissance, uh, it influenced uh, even the art in the Catholic churches. Great, thank you. So the, icon, the iconoclasm uh, was over, let's say it lasted a few decades or a hundred years or so. And eventually they decided to, well, yes, we can represent icons, but uh, we can represent the, the saints and, and um, Jesus, but it kind of caused this movement uh, of, the, of the artists from, with that background into Europe. Great, thank you. Um, a couple of guests were wondering about the Sistine Chapel and just visiting. Um, and picture taking, which I know is, all, is, always a, uh, is always a topic. So do you know the latest kind of a, the limitations with picture taking? Is it the same as it's always been? Unfortunately, yes. In the Vatican museums, which are extraordinary, we see mm, Raphael and the tapestries and statues and, and it's allowed to take pictures everywhere except in the Sistine Chapel. So there was a question of, of copyright uh, in the past because of the cleaning that was done by that Japanese uh, uh, TV. They had the copyright of the pictures during and after the, the cleaning and the restoration. And from what I know, it expired. But they're trying to prevent, especially during, during the day, the chaos, you know, and all those selfies and all that craze. But of course, we wouldn't do that. They, they know that. But simply, they kind of try to be uh, consistent. And um, I'm, unless... I'm 
I cannot say, you know, it did happen that even occasionally a guard would say, okay, but that was in the past. Who, who knows, will they be in a better mood when we come back? Hmm, I hope so. <laughs> I always hope. Um, okay, this might be a joint question, actually, if I can bring you in here, Brenda, as well. Um, some guests have some questions about the hotels in Rome, uh, specifically the Hotel uh, Majestic that I believe we stay in. Um, could you speak to anything about the hotels? I mean, a, a, anything special or particular about them? Well, I can answer that, that we use, we have seven or eight tours that go to Rome. We use the Hotel Majestic on our week in Rome and the Amalfi Coast. And you know, it was funny, the Majestic was the very first hotel that we used on our first classic Italy tour. Because of the popularity of Italy and especially Rome, we've expanded to seven or eight different uh, hotels. We, most of our hotels are in the Via Veneto area where the Hotel Majestic is. Easy walk, easy, easily a walking distance from the Piazza di Spagna and uh, to the center. And uh, there are a number of restaurants there. Uh, most of our hotels are all um, more or less five star. Uh, although I hate to use the star system in Italy because it doesn't really equate all the time, but we do try to use hotels in Rome that reflect the heritage and the culture of the city. And that's one thing that you feel the design, the Italian design is very important to when uh, you're staying in a hotel in Italy that you feel like you're in Italy and not in any city per se. So I hope that helps. Thanks, Brenda. Olga, oh, anything to add or, or is that okay? Um, I like all the hotels that Doug takes um, or people too. I like the Excelsior with its touch of um, old style, old, uh, uh, old, uh, old, old world. Or Parco dei Principi, where we go with the, with the bridges or Splendid Real. You know, these are all really great hotels and, uh, and a lovely, lovely area where the emperors and the popes lived. And now we come with our groups. I believe that. It's very <laughs> tough, no, it's, really. It's, it's lovely, lovely. lovely. It's yeah. quite a contrast. They're very so interesting, right? Just to be able to stay in such an old place that is, you know, revived and new, and uh, you can really think about the history and, and where you actually are at the moment. It's pretty incredible. Um, you know, there's not too many more questions. I mean, you did a fantastic job. I think you floored everyone. Uh, there's a ton of great positive comments with all the information you shared. Um, is there anything you want to end with, Olga, or? or uh, any other tidbit you wanted to get across about Rome? About Rome, uh, it's so much. You know, I, I tried to squeeze in these these three thousand years of history in uh, in forty five minutes. Well, uh, I really may invite everyone to to watch if you would like to know a little little more. There is a relatively similar presentation I did. It's called A Day in Rome, and it's uh, it's on my site uh, for for free. And then several aspects of Rome are also there if you would like to go deeper into some of the art collections. And uh, there's even one on the, on the Sistine Chapel, but it's on my, on my YouTube. Uh, I did it for um, a nonprofit organization in, uh, in US. So um, there would be a, a list of things to, to do and read and watch the movies. Um, it took me 30 years and I still feel like, oh, I haven't been there. I haven't seen this. Rome is really inspirational. And uh, if, if, you're, if you're coming to, to Italy, Rome is definitely a place to see. But then again, what's my favorite place? Oh, is it Sorrento? Oh, is it Venice? My God, maybe Florence. So it's so difficult to say. Italy is really, really unique. And Rome is mine, so I love it more than anything else, but uh, uh, I, I feel happy. There are places in Italy like Venice and Sorrento, for example, where I just get off the train or whatever it is, and I'm just like happy just like that. That's amazing. Everyone wants to be in a place like that, right? You're happy just walking. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in Sorrento, a little limoncello helps. But. <laughs> Uh, that's a great way to end. Um, Olga, do you mind going back a slide and just putting your information up one more time? I think there are some guests interested in contacting you. Um, it's, there we go. 
There you go, oh, ogarome.com. Right. And uh, yes, to those who are wondering if this presentation was recorded, yes, it is. It will be sent out to all of you um, tomorrow afternoon at some point, once we get a little editing done with it. Um, and it'll also live on our blog page, The Talker, uh, indefinitely. So if you do need to access it again or want to share it with someone else, you can definitely do so. Or you can go to Olga's site and check out even more Rome content that she has as well. Um, Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining our last event of the year. Thank you, Olga, for sending us off 2021 with a fantastic presentation. Um, we thank you again to those who joined multiple multiple of these throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for engaging with us. And thank you, Brenda, for joining many of these as we go to Italy a lot on our presentations. And uh, Brenda is all things Italy, so she joins a lot. So again, just big thank yous overall. Happy holidays. And we wish you all the best and uh, enjoy the end of the year. And hope to see you out there in Italy next year. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, all, everyone. Bye-bye.